On today's video, I'm talking about the small world of Warcraft, one of the most popular gateway games out there, now combines with one of the most popular video game RPGs out there. Is it a complete gimmick? Does the game stand on its own? Should you consider upgrading? This is what you're here to find out. Hi everyone, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple and if you're new to this channel then stay tuned for I will be talking about board games and the people who play them. Days of Wonder, who put out lots of really interesting light games, have now decided to re-implement their original Small World game into Small World of Warcraft. So for those of you unfamiliar with Small World, don't worry, I'm going to explain the basics of the game as if you've never seen it before. Small World is an area control game where each player is vying for control over a very small amount of regions on a map board. In this case, you have several islands that you use, which you can use in different combinations based on the player count, whereas previously you just had a board that was set for a specific player count. Players will first take control of a race that will have its own faction power as well as a special ability tied to it. However, what ability is tied to it is randomized each game. Essentially, the faction and the abilities come in two sections of a tile, and they are placed in a selection with several different rows, so you've got choices. Before the game starts, each player will decide which one of the combinations they want to begin with, and will use coins, which are also victory points, in order to move further down the selection if they want to get a specific race combination. Throughout the game though, you will be able to switch to other races by putting your race into what's called decline. You'll essentially use your race for as long as you can, get some points, fight over regions, and then eventually decide, you know what, I need to move on, I need to try out a different race. So you'll put them into decline, flip all the tokens over, they'll stay there until they get kicked out by other means, usually other players, and then you will be able to pick another race combination. And because these are randomized every game, you can get all sorts of different combinations from diplomatic orcs to frenzy goblins to well, what else would it be flying sorcerers that was the bane of the original small world in fact you'll be glad to know flying is not a power in this game so uh, those of you who know how overpowered that was in the previous version of small world you'll be glad to know it doesn't exist here anymore so to conquer regions you take control of all of your race tokens and how many you have depends on the faction combination you picked and you will use these to occupy regions each region takes a different number of tokens to occupy based on whether it's got any terrain such as mountains any fortifications or some native tribe that happen to be in the area that you need to fight off. In the original game, they were just simply natives. In this version, they are murlocs. And whoever decided to make murlocs the standard neutral race in this game is a genius and I want to shake his hand. Because anybody who has played World of Warcraft knows that murlocs are one of the funniest creatures to have ever appeared in an RPG game. Death will rise from Of course, when the regions start running out, there's only one way to get more, you're going to have to gently nudge your opponents out of the way. All combat is deterministic, so you do not have to roll a die for combat. You essentially look at the modifiers, check what the situation is for the, uh, the attacker and the defender, and then that will determine how many tokens you need to do it, and you will just automatically succeed. With one little exception, your last assault, where you are just short on tokens, you can roll a reinforcement die in order to boost your attack for that one final assault only. No guarantee it will work, but it's the one time that you will throw a die. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen with regards to combat. At the end of every turn, players will score points based on what regions they occupy, and some regions may score more than others depending on what you have. You'll also be able to pick up magic items or visit special power places that can give you some bonuses, and of course, at the end of the set number of rounds, whoever has the most coins, i.e. victory points, is the winner. Of course! Now I will be making comparisons to the original Small World for those of you more familiar with the game, but also explaining what this game is like just on its own, and we're going to kickstart with duration. Both versions of Small World take about the same time really, we're talking between 60 to 90 minutes, and that is essentially based on whether you're teaching the game, whether you've got any slow players, or if you're playing with the highest player count. For the most part, you should easily make this within 90 minutes, even with teaching, because there's not a huge amount of rules to explain, and the game itself is only a set number of rounds. So it's mainly just a case of how long it takes people to do their turns, and it's not like you're playing a super strategic 4x game here where you need to consider all sorts of ramifications. No, you usually have some idea of like, right, this is where I'm going to go, I need a token for there, two for there, three for there, and your turn is done in fairly quick time. 
There can be a little bit of downtime though if you are playing with a high player count, mainly if you're waiting for your turn to come back round and the people who are doing any attacking are not directly involved with you. And to be honest, even if they are involved with you, you don't really have much of a say in the combat. As I said, it's deterministic. If I'm playing the orcs and I'm sitting in my little area and then suddenly the night elves want to come by and say hello, it's not like I can do much to kick them back. They have the tokens, they kick me out, I take my tokens back, lose a couple for casualties, but that's pretty much my only involvement on other people's turns. I mean, feel free to try and goad each other into attacking somebody else on the table. After all, it's every man for themselves. But otherwise, yeah, you can enter some downtime issues if playing with a high player count. But I usually recommend doing that when you are either comfortable with the length of the game or everybody's familiar with the game already. So we're moving on to E for ease of play. How easy is the game to grok? Well, this game was regarded as a gateway game. I like to think it's more of a next step up. It's still a light game, it's pretty easy, but there are one or two things in here that you have to consider that will flummox a few new players. And those instances are kind of repeated here as well. And thankfully, to help with the ease of play, Days of Wonder have at least resumed their idea of giving you these giant reference sheets. Now, of course, I find it a little bit intimidating to give a new player a giant reference sheet with some homework on it effectively. It's like, oh yeah, you've got over 15 odd races and 15 odd abilities. Well, you will be tested, but it's nice to have it anyway. Although the weird thing is, gives you all the game turn, gives you all the terrain, the artifacts, the legendary places, all right, very good. Gives you all the races and special powers with explanations. Okay, brilliant. This is what it needed in the game. They give you six in the box. Game only goes up to five players. However, one thing that I'm going to get a little bit fanboy over, not that this is going to affect the rating too much, but I just got to give credit where it's due. They give you a chart to how to organize the tray inside the box. Finally, somebody does this. How many times on videos in the past have I gone mad trying to say why do they not put a setup diagram for how your components go in your box, especially when you've got so many components and such a complicated insert that it's a nightmare trying to figure out. It's like the Krypton factor. Here, they at least do it this time. They tell you where every token goes, where all the different ability factions go, because there's different space for each one. They tell you where the board go, the money go, the banners go. And yes, this isn't exactly the most complicated game in the world to figure that out on your own, but they do it. They do it, so credit where it's due, I thank you, it's about time one publisher did this. Well, one down, how many to go? So moving on to T for tactics and strategy. Well, strategy is only so much in this game because it's very much an affair of seeing what the board landscape is like as well as your faction ability. You can decide, oh yeah, I fancy that faction later, I'll go for it. But really, your only particular strategic element is down to when you put your race into decline. Do you do it early and just get another race with a bunch of tokens? Uh, you just basically go, here's my swarm. <laughs> and then go into decline instantly, or do you spend some time with the faction you've got, you know, you're conquering a little bit each time, you're in a defensive position, and then only when you start getting whittled down by opponents do you think, eh, maybe now's a good time to go into decline. And the timing of this is key. Wasting a turn going into decline at the wrong time can cost you quite an amount of points if you're not careful. Otherwise, it's a tactical affair, trying to make the best use out of your faction combination and deciding where on the board, or in this case boards, that you want to go and conquer. Do I go attack that player because they're getting a few too many points? Well, someone's going to have to, you can't let someone run away with it, but then this area is nice and easy for me to conquer. That place over there is not ideal, but there's a cool relic over there, I'd quite like to get that. And there's a lot of different choices as to where you might decide to attack, even though adjacency is the name of the game. But a lot of the crux of this is more about where to attack as well as manipulating your faction bonus and race ability to its fullest. Wasting it is not good. You don't just want like a blank block of card in front of you to say, I am the orcs full stop. No, whatever their ability is, you need to munchkin that every turn. You need to milk it for all that it's worth. And that's good fun because as those races come out in different combinations, you have lots of different variations as to what you can do. And during a game, it might you might get a particular combination that comes up and it's like, Oh, that could work really well. I really need that. Yes, I need that. that yeah, I can do you. Yeah, you think you're you think you're safe there? I'm gonna get this combination here. Here's my uh, I don't know gun ho gnomes. I don't know. That's not an actual ability, but gnomes are a thing. And then you can go into it later. Of course, you've only got so many rounds in the game, so you've got to be 
efficient with what you're doing, but you get to make these cool choices every now and again. But other than that, you can also play the game with a little team variant, the Battle for Azeroth. I nearly said Azeroth there, that would have been a very different game. And with this, essentially because of the whole idea of the Alliance and the Horde and some neutral races, players split into teams, and those teams can only pick races from their particular faction. Other than that, the game pretty much plays identical to how it was before, but with a few little changes as to how you select races and set up those rows. But for the most part, you just carry on as you were. Now, this is primarily designed for four to five players. It can play two to three. Personally, don't do that. I have not played this with two to three players. I've only done it with four and five. And personally, I can't see the point of playing it with less players because if you're gonna split the teams like Horde versus Alliance with two players, then, well, isn't that just the same as a normal two player game? And the same goes for a three player game. You have Horde, Alliance, and Neutral. But again, isn't that just all against all? It makes no sense. Really, four and five is where it's at, where you could have two Horde versus two Alliance, you could have a two Horde, two Alliance, and one Neutral, and the game is pretty much as you would expect from a small world game, it's not particularly different, but the twist here is that if you are on a team with multiple players, you only score the lowest value, it does the whole Knizia thing which can be quite good, to, especially if you've got new players in the group. What I like to do is I like to think, right, well, hang on, the two of us have played this enough times, we know what we're doing, so how about we go on opposite teams, and you two, you're new, so each of us gets a new player, which means that each of us has a slight handicap of having someone who's not familiar with the game, but then it gives us the incentive to help that player because they're on our team. I find that the team mode is actually a very good way to teach the game if you're in that situation. Now, if you've only got one person out of everybody who's uh, just figuring the game out for the first time, the team mode's not going to work quite as well. But if you've got at least two new players, it's a pretty solid way to do things. Moving on to A for aesthetics, and just like the original Small World, Miguel Coimbra, I hope I haven't butchered that name, it does it again. It looks gorgeous. On the table, the artwork is bright and colourful. Yeah, there may be neater, sharper artwork, like say if you were looking at Abyss or Rising Sun, for example, but the artwork in this is just popping on the table. For young players this is going to appeal to them because they'll see it looks really pretty and that will appeal to kids for example. But even then, if you were walking past this table, you would notice, oh, okay, what's this? Small world. And it would instantly grab your attention because it really does stand out from pretty much anything else you'll have on the table. Nothing else on your table is going to surpass this in terms of color unless you're playing this with a bunch of rainbow unicorn mascots. I don't know. But everything in here, great component quality. The tiles are decent and thick. The coin counters are decent quality. You, you know, you don't need metal coins in that in this. It's perfectly fine. But the faction artwork is good. Everything just is well packaged. And even better, the insert is really good as well because everything has got a place for it. But the faction tokens have a little box with a lid that you put the faction tokens in and it keeps it nicely together in one sort of easy to reach box where when you're playing the game, you simply just pop the box on the side of the table and then when you need the tokens, you just go, oh, I need the humans. Uh, oh, there they are, right there. And you just Filch them out and then put them back in when you're done with the game. Nice and easy. Everything else can pretty much just stay in the box and just be taken out of the box as and when you need it. Everything here has been done with a decent amount of effort. Now this is going to be an interesting one here as I go into I for Immersion. How well is the theme represented? Well, the big question here is, is the World of Warcraft theme a gimmick? Yes and no. It is a little bit of a gimmick. I mean, it's the weirdest kind of thing I expected. You know, why this particular video game to be used as a theme, especially when it was 2009 when the original Small World was released and World of Warcraft's been out for a good amount of time. But it's not a complete waste. The factions play out like you probably would expect them to do in the video game. The artwork is reminiscent of the video game because they worked with Blizzard on this. So it's not like you look at the Night Elf and go, it looks nothing like a Night Elf. No, it actually looks like the video game. And I will say, I have played and enjoyed World of Warcraft in my time. I have many, I suppose, fond memories of being a teenager and constantly arguing with my brother as to who gets use of the internet when we, all we had was 56k modems at that time and playing the original World of Warcraft, going in raids, you will not find a better healer than me elsewhere. All right, you probably would, but I was still, I was a pretty good healer. But I really sunk a lot of hours into World of Warcraft. So when I heard they were making this game, I thought, do it justice, don't you know? mess with me on this, but I have not played World of Warcraft in over a decade and a half, so it's not like I'm that fussed. But yeah, I got fond memories of it. And if you are a fan of World of Warcraft, you'll probably get a decent amount of almost like Easter eggs here. 
but it does mean that the factions feel like the factions and it fits with this whole small world mechanic of going to other lands and kicking each other out. There's also nice little touches here and there where if you attack a race of an opposing faction, you get extra points for doing it. So the whole alliance versus horde war plays out thematically as the game progresses, because you might think, well, I could go and kick this player down, but uh, hordes over there, I'd get more points. And this works with the team mode as well, because you might think, well, hang on, five players, that person on his own is a neutral player, they're just going to get kicked around a lot. Well, not necessarily, because you never get bonus points for attacking that neutral player, whereas you will get bonus points for attacking the opposite faction to you. And that is enough of an incentive to make players gun ho for the other team rather than going after the neutral player. So at least it self-balances itself in that respect. But mainly this is just to be a nice little easter egg for World of Warcraft fans. Now if you don't like World of Warcraft or don't know anything about it, it doesn't really matter. You could just think of this as generic fantasy races. And quickly, just to wrap up, L for longevity, is there enough variety in the game? Yeah, there's a pretty good amount of races and faction abilities here. They're very varied, there's some differences from the original version that you won't have seen before, but there is some repetition of them but there's plenty enough variety in just those alone to keep you going. But with an added bonus, you have the team variant that you can play, and also because you're not using just a flat board that's scaled for that player count, you have all these different island pieces in the game, and you use a certain amount of large, medium, or small ones depending on what player count you have. And there's different amounts of each one. So you could play a four player game that say wants you to use a medium and a large piece for islands. You have a game and there's your pieces. You could play the exact same combination again of four players with whatever factions, but get two different landscape tiles. So already you have a bit of a different setup and that's always a good thing. And the distribution of those various places of power and those relic items again can influence each game. So in terms of variety, there's a good amount here to last you a fair few games before you feel like you've seen everything. And even then, you've got all the ways that the different combinations of races can come out. It's not like, oh well, I've seen this combination before, that's fine. But yeah, but if it comes out early compared to later, that could still influence your decision in a big way as to whether the ability combination is useful. This game also has the benefit of scaling very well with players. Less so with two players, I find. Two players is still good, but it's not as good as three, four, and five. But three, four, and five, whatever, pick him. Most games struggle to scale and usually I'm like, oh, I don't want to play this with four, I don't want to play this with the maximum player count, I don't want to play it with too many, but here, three, four or five, I'll happily play this. Granted, it's going to take a little bit longer to play the game because five players means more time, which is the one caveat, but in terms of the fairness of how the board is laid out and all the different races, three, four, five, whatever, even two, this game will scale pretty well throughout. So my final word on Small World is that this is a pleasant return of a classic gateway game of old. Well, I say old, 2009, that's pretty old in our board game industry. Here, it's been re-implemented with a theme that will not detract people's enjoyment if you're unaware of it, but will bring in new players who are more familiar with World of Warcraft into a game they might not have otherwise tried. It retains the same elements from the original Small World that made that an enjoyable game to play. Doesn't diverge from the formula too much, so I will say that if you weren't a fan of Small World, this one isn't gonna change your mind and suddenly you know, break, break boundaries for you. But if you are new to Small World, I can highly recommend picking up this title over the original Small World because you're getting the team variant as well as the additional relics and places that you can go to in here, which the original Small World does not have. You have to get Small World Underground and maybe one or two expansions to get to the same level as this one. And the original one had boards, this one now has islands. There's just a few little small tweaks in this version that actually, in my opinion, makes this the definitive Small World that if you want to own the game, you should own. Now, of course, do not decide that, oh, I've got the original Small World, I should upgrade to this. No, 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 no. If you have Small World and some expansions or even just the original Small World, just hang on to that. You're perfectly fine. But with this though, I certainly say that if you're brand new, grab it. So my final verdict for Small World of Warcraft is an 8 out of 10. It was never going to be sort of distinction level for me. The original Small World I rated about a 7. It was a good game. I didn't necessarily like love it to bits on a personal level, but I gave it good respect for the fact that it was a decent lightweight area control game with a good amount of variety. It just needed a few expansions to get working. Well now, they're purpose built. The World of Warcraft theme sings to me a little bit more just from nostalgia. I feel that the improvements they've made by using island tiles and adding in the relics, 
just elevates this one a little bit above the previous Small World, and I feel it's deserving of a solid 8. Now, I hope you've enjoyed my content on the Broken Meeple, but I'm not the only content creator out there who's producing video content for you. There are other channels that you should give a look, including this one. Hello, my name is Bill Webb, aka Billy Indiana. I've been married for 31 years. I have three children and five grandchildren and one dog. I've been teaching science and coaching basketball since 1992, and I am a music lover, a Dodgers fan, and a board game enthusiast. Since January 2020, I've been creating content as Billy Indiana about my board gaming hobby. Lately, I've been focusing primarily on partial playthroughs and reviews of board games, as well as unboxing videos. I hope you'll come check out my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'd like to thank The Broken Meeple for promoting my channel. So that's it for me on this video. If you liked what you see and have earned your subscription, please click the avatar in the center of the screen to subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about future content. Alternatively, you can check out the most recent review on my channel or the most recent folded space insert review I've also done. Until next time, remember, it's only a game.